Well, hello, everyone. And here we are, What is Truth, Part 76. I'm here with His Grace, Reverend David William Perry. And he, he, he still, uh, he's not comfortable with your excellence or your grace, but he has to he has to keep in mind that the re, the title the honorific has to do with the the respect given to the apostolic succession of which he is in company with and it's not to david the young lad but it's the venerable institution in which he has aligned himself. So that being said, now that Reverend David William Perry is an archbishop, we offer our congratulations and you should be wearing your new ring. <laughs> but yeah, that being said, Reverend David, how are you there? I, I missed talking to you over these few weeks. I, I hugely miss talking with you as well, John, and our, our listeners. It's it's just been one of those things. Um, point taken, yeah, I mean, the honorifics are important. <coughs> as I've said, <coughs> I just find it very difficult. You know, I'm, I'm a minister trying to win some souls for Christ as opposed to maybe what some of my colleagues think or... or, or are approaching in their ministries. Um, you have to remember, yeah, I'm in full apostolic succession. As I've said on this show before, there are, there are three types of Catholic. Even the Pope of Rome, any of them, wouldn't disagree with that. You know, there, there's the Roman Catholic, which is by far your biggest herd. Um, there's the Alexandrian Catholics, which I think fared slightly better than, than us. Uh, you have married priests, uh, family men. I mean, most of their higher up clergy are drawn from the monasteries rather than like in the Orthodox tradition, Christian Orthodoxy. Uh, I'm from the bad boy route, the Antiochian, the, the Catholics of Antioch, um, who always wanted to stretch people's frames of reference, which is probably why um, the Syrian monasteries, which is where we get our lineage, we're always under attack and always under suspicion, although no one could actually argue with the apostolic succession. Uh, we're all in partial communion with Rome, um, I believe, because you know, these things get hugely complicated, and I'm not a canon lawyer. I mean, there are so many different types of Antiochian, Alexandrian, Roman. I mean, you know, uh, we're, both the Alexandrians and the Antiochians are in partial communion with Rome, but in full communion with each other. I think we're in partial communion with Lutherans, Anglicans, and so on and so on and so on. I've got a, a treat for you. There we go. I've got a treat for you. Yeah. That's my new ring. <laughs> um, Is it big enough? So, yeah, I mean, I'm... I ex they, they wanted to raise my rank because I opened a, a chapel, of course, a church during the pandemic. Um, I felt there was no other choice. It wasn't really an easy maneuver. There were so many people who were cut off from each other and so many people that were succumbing to loneliness and genuine paranoia. <clears throat> not, not the type, excuse me, of mock paranoia that, that fuels social media, but genuine paranoia. Um, and also my congregation, I mean, most of them uh, are robust heterosexuals. Um, some of my congregation isn't robust. Um, some of them are quite, they've got frail health. Some of them have got uh, topics and issues they need to deal with. That's not me saying it, that's them saying it. Um, before they feel they can really celebrate in a church, but they're part of us. So there wasn't really a choice from my point of view, but hey, what can you do? Uh, we kept it going. We've kept it going all the way through. Uh, one service a month, we kept in rule with all the COVID guidelines so nobody could shut us down. No one was attacking us. 
social distancing, hand sprays, the lot. And so since we've managed to pull that off, the, the powers that be decided, OK, let's let's give David the, the shock of his life and uh, actually raise him to this lofty and noble position. I still, however, see myself as a busy pastor trying to bring a few gentle, loving thoughts into people's lives. How has it been with you, John? Well, actually, it's been uh, it's been good. You know, I mean, when, when it gets down to it, uh, like Bob Dylan said, uh, any day above ground is a good day. And uh, so in light of that, actually, my my health is fine and everything else, you know, so. I, I recently had the in, uh, great pleasure of going out and spending a couple of days at Douglas and Tyler Gabriel's wonderful home. Uh, and we also had Michael McKibben there from Americans for Innovation. That's the sister organization of Americans uh, American Intelligence Media, the, the group I've been associated with for so long, being that it's run by my best friend Douglas and his wife, who's my BFF, best female friend, other than my delightful Barbara. But that being said, um, we were able to do four different shows together. Of course, they're not available on this particular platform. And so what you can do is you can look below to the truth bits and that will provide you with a link that you can go to see what we have posted. And uh, we did quite an exploration into the uh, history and workings of the transnational cabal that everybody's so concerned about. And as you know, we tend to put our emphasis on facts. We're not into conspiracy theories so much as we try to find what the fact basis is of, of these conspiracies. Conspir conspiracy in the first place means to breathe together. And so uh, when a bunch of people get in a church and they pray together, <clears throat> well, they're essentially conspiring, aren't they? But it's been created a dirty word since the CIA uh, recast it as, as they, they tend to play the word game. And so word inversion is one of the tactics of people that are seeking for power. And, and that's part of the challenge. And uh, there's a nice quote, but I, I don't have it at my hand, so I won't bother with that one. Uh, and you're probably wondering what I'm talking about. But I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll share with you uh, Georg Cantor, who was a German mathematician, and he created set theory, which is a fundamental theory in mathematics, uh, you know, a plus A equals A, A plus B, B plus A, B plus B, so on and so forth. And that is a way of uh, assembling concepts to be able to, to get into uh, further insights. But uh, there's a view of that whole way of looking at the world that's called the open set. And that's the radical assumption that you don't know everything, that you don't have all the information. Therefore, your closed set, your set theory is incomplete unless it's an open set, which means that there's the unforeseen intervention. And so uh, Georg Cantor, who was born in 1845 and March 3rd and passed on January 6, 1918 said, to ask the right question is harder than to answer it. Um, I'm forgetting my manners. Um, firstly, happy Novruz um, and happy spring equinox. 
Um, I've just been with my online Persian Christians because, of course, they do celebrate Novruz. It's not Muslim. Actually, it's a Zoroastrian spring festival. So if anybody's watching, uh, salam and happy Novruz. Uh, to, uh, the to the malcontents that are still watching me from that part of the world. Um, and happy Novruz and happy spring equinox to yourself, John and Barbara. Um, Cantor, yeah, transfinite mathematics, um, a rather clever young man. Um, apparently, it wasn't when he was looking at infinity times two, which of course makes no logical sense at all, that uh, he was going a bit crazy. It was when he was looking at infinity times six that the pressure began to get him. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, his followers uh, sound more like born again mathematicians than they do mathematicians. Uh, somebody said a couple of years back, uh, what was it? No one's going to drive them from the paradise that's been revealed by Cantor. And I suppose for once, as much as I admire visionary anybody, anybody in any field who deserves the visionary status is onto something. I must admit, I couldn't quite quite help wondering what the hell are you on about as well? Um, you know, systems of measurement. At the end of the day, there's systems of measurement. What, what are you measuring? Right, that's an esoteric question for mathematicians. And um, hopefully one day they, they'll tell us all. Um, I think I've got my head around Planck lengths and uh, non-localities. I think I've got my head around that. All of which, of course, is instantly subsumed and spirited away, if Cantor is correct. Um, but yeah, yeah, more power, more power to all of them. It sounds great fun. It sounds mind blowing. I notice mainstream contemporary mathematics uh, dislikes him with a vengeance. So there's yet another sign that we ought to stand by him. Um, you know, the, what was it? The, math, the mathematics uh, of the insular. I can't remember what somebody was calling it recently. The mathem in other words, reductive mathematics to fit a reductive system. Um, I was talking, one of the, <laughs> do that a different way. Um, when I was producing and hosting Gruntlers, uh, many years ago, it was a seven year long arts entertainment multimedia project, quite a few years ago now. Uh, it started as Gruntlers. The idea was, you know, looking at those words that haven't survived without a negative prefix. So everybody knows disgruntled, but nobody knows gruntled anymore. So we were the gruntlers. We were having a nice time. Um, and some of the meetings we held did dent the, the half-dead cultural apparatus of London. Uh, Ray Tallis, Professor Raymond Tallis, was one of us. International savant, clever dicky all round. And I'd made the mistake in his, his eyes of calling... Oh, yeah, humanist, born-again humanist. I think there's more to you, Ray, than that. If you're ever listening to this, I think there's more going on there. Um, and, uh, you know, the stories he would talk about, Richard, tell him about Richard Dawkins, but that's for another show. That's for another show. Um, you know, what he'd say, because we called it, what was it, Gruntlers Get Infinite or something along those lines. I'd have to look up the catalogue of old posters we've got. <clears throat> excuse me, and he said, well, not really infinite, metaphorically infinite, uh, to which I said, but, you know, how can anybody, how can anybody make pronouncements on that level? Um, but anyway, you know, the show was just about to go on as far as I remember, so there's no no chance of actually talking to anybody at any depth. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what amazes me in modern academia is that it's completely against the spirit of Cantor it's against the elevated, it's against the transcendent, it's against quality. Um, everything is a measurement of quantity. I take the point, how do you measure qualities? I take the point. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but I take the point. You know, and if everything is a measurement of a f affinitude, if any, everything is a measurement of some type of finite substance, then you very quickly get into the present credo. There is no other word for it. Uh, of universities have clearly abandoned the Greek search for goodness, beauty, and truth, because now you have a priesthood defending an ideology, um, which appears to be reductive materialism. 
uh, because it's a nice comfy fit. Um, and dare I say, oh, dare I? Yes, I do. Sorry. Um, is it because it's easier to get government funding if you say you're coming from that angle? Uh, oh, Boris, I've got this vision about transfer mathematics. You'd be shown the door. You know, if you've got a vision about how you can get, four, you know, 14 people in every set of 20 learning something or other that everybody's relatively happy with, that cuts the ice. I mean, it, it always saddens me that some of the most visionary, some of the most startlingly original theses I've ever seen either didn't get past the committee um, accepting somebody onto a doctoral course. People forget you don't just turn up bright eyed and bushy tailed and say, I'm going to get, get on a, a I'm going to be a doctor or something. You have to pass a committee assessment, at least in this part of the world. Um, and some of them haven't. And the ones that have, it was considered so far outside of the mainframe uh, that it was never discussed again. So, OK, you've got your doctorate. Now, can you piss off, please? Because you're disturbing everybody else. And I've heard that story just one too many times to really feel comfortable. Um, and, you know, it was Chuck Missler. But, I mean, you know, with great respect to evangelicals, I'm finishing, I promise, John, with great respect. And they're always looking for dark powers to start attacking them. They're all, you know, they're always looking for it. Um, in this particular case, I mean, he was right. Uh, there's a priesthood. There's an ideology. <clears throat> there's a... Uh, uh, um, you know, there are accusations of heresy if you're out, too far outside of the mainstream narrative. And this isn't science, and it's certainly not scholarship. Um, and the sooner we, we get past all this, the better. Is Karl Marx to blame? No. People tend to forget, I've got to get that book. People tend to forget that wonderful quote in one of his last books, thank God I'm not a Marxist. Now, that's that gets a thumbs up from me. Um uh, you know, so even if he can see the problem that's on its way as a gifted economist, I mean, how far has the comfort zone taken over in academia since then? I suspect far too far, and we're all beginning to pay the price of it. Handing back to you, John. Well, yeah, that's, uh, again, the acquisition of power. That's the challenge, isn't it? Uh, I'm one of them and you're not. And it, it's like that old joke that I've told before, but I think it's been a year or so since I told it. The guy dies and he floats up to heaven and he runs into Archangel Michael. And Michael's leading him down a hallway and, and he asks, well, what are all these doors? Well, that door over there, they're Methodists and these here, these are the Baptists, and these are the Greek Orthodox. And, uh, and you get further down the hall, and there's this closed door. And he said, well, who's that? What He says, oh, that's the Catholics. They, they think they're the only ones up here. And uh, that kind of sums up academia. And uh, ultimately, I think that in looking at the, the ideas of, of someone like Georg Cantor or uh, some of the things that, that Wittgenstein, your good buddy Wittgenstein, said uh, regarding Georg Cantor. I mean, geez, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, he lamented that mathematics is, quote, ridden through and through with the pernicious idioms of set theory, which he dismissed as utter nonsense that is laughable and wrong. So there's no, there's no love lost there. And, uh, but in, in looking at these things the way uh, you would from spiritual science, it gives you kind of a different vantage point because the, the structure of thinking is, is based on the apparatus of thinking. Okay. So that you're, basically neurologically thinking things through in a linear way. And that's your typical way of thinking about things. But that's not the limit. That is 
merely uh, things look the way they look because of the apparatus of your eye. Now, if you had frog eyes, or if you had bird's eyes, or, or any other creature, the world will look different. And even science knows that with their, their implements of measure, number, and weight. But in getting into looking at thinking, what is thinking is thinking uh, dependent on our neurological system. Well, ordinary thinking is. And so we have this tendency to want to approach things and have this very sequential series of, of concepts that, that we link together and that provides us with uh, a nexus of, of concepts that enables us to come to some kind of conclusion about whether or not we're going to have tea or whatever our uh, goal might be. But Rudolf Steiner and his philosophy of freedom that, that I know you're familiar with, although it's probably been a while, but the whole concept of being able to, to through examination of thinking, and he does it, mind you, in, in a way that's that's could only be called symphonic. I mean, because the way in which the, the book is put together, it's, it's so uh, connected together that you can't really just like skip it. Well, I'll just go to the back of the book and read the punchline. You can't really uh, elevate yourself into the realm in which it exists normally by doing that. Uh, I am sure there are exceptional individuals that only need cliff notes to get there, but they're not the, your average individual. But that book was written so that somebody using this very linear type of thinking I've just been describing would be able to come to the conclusion that there is a sense-free thinking. And it's through that particular past that Rudolf Steiner himself was able to bring about his personal development. And so when asked which one of his works would be of most lasting value far in the future, he said, oh, the philosophy of freedom. And so it's central, uh, regardless of what one might think and that it does tend to be kind of dry, like philosophic work. Uh, but uh, if you can follow it through, it basically is a manual on how to think like an angel. Which, if you look at what Rudolf Steiner said about what that might mean, he said that angels are entirely different than people. That they don't have to go through this whole sequential sequence of logic. That they can enter a concept and simultaneously be able to uh, have a grasp of, of the concept. And so that's the path that, that uh, results in its end result is the philosophy of freedom or variously titled the philosophy of spiritual activity. And so that's thinking as a spiritual process. And, he, and that's really the level at which we have the potential for freedom. And, uh, and that's an answer to, again, the conversations we've had about Friedrich Schiller and his whole approach on the aesthetic education of man. And he said, you know, there's the struggle between reason and then the irrational uh, drives of nature and that it's the artic, artist that, that dwells in between the two of those through achieving uh, some measure of balance. Oops. And uh, Rudolf Steiner said that's very good, but that's, that's a very effective description of, of that from the vantage point of the intellectual soul, which is very much tied into that whole need for sequential thinking. And he said, likewise for Dante's, uh, Divine Comedy. Both works were written at the age at which they've uh, come into a mature relationship to their intellectual soul. And that the, 
the when you get into a deeper level with it, you're able to take it uh, further because the see the spiritual soul, which is the consciousness soul. Once the consciousness soul has been worked into through uh, a method like the philosophy of freedom, then there's the intellectual soul. So the consciousness soul relates to the physical, the intellectual soul to the etheric body, and the sentient soul to the astral body. So it's strong in, in the feeling realm. And so a lot of people, they get relief in their sentient soul by attending mass, going to church, right? It's, it's a, a kind of a cleansing and relief in the realm of feeling, which can help one tame one's emotions. And that's a very good thing. The intellectual soul is attempting to find a, a, a means through uh, the process of reason to, to come to a viable understanding of whatever problem one challenges with. The, the consciousness soul is is quite different, and it's quite to get to a clear understanding of what that is. You have to get into some of the more esoteric concepts of Rudolf Steiner, because if you remember, the period in which we're in, we're in the archangelic period of of Michael. So that means that we've left the archangelic period of the archangel Gabriel, and he had said that. During the archangelic period of Gabriel, which is the period of families and groups and your nation and all these group associations and secret clubs and all of that, that was appropriate at that time, he said, we've moved beyond that. And now is the, the time for the free individual. And But he said that during the age of Gabriel, that there was an actual metamorphosis of the structure of the convolutions of the brain that could even be uh, studied were one to examine uh, a, a body from, like, say, the 12th century, for example. You'd see that there's a subtle difference and that it was there to make uh, a way so that it created a form in which Michaelic thought could take place. But he also said, if we don't develop spiritual thinking, that that organ that everybody has will atrophy. And that's the path that, that so much of mankind is going down now is, is that secular humanism that really has no provision for the world of spirit and the super sensible. Yeah, I think it's sort of easy gains and quick solutions that are haunting the world at the minute. You know, is the world far too often a dark and, and, and threatening place? Yes, but our ancestors knew that as well. Um, you know, I don't know people nowadays like, they appear to like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I just don't understand it. Although at the back of my mind somewhere, I can sort of see, you know, there are so many contradictions <clears throat> Excuse me, there are so many problems that people just think, oh, right, enough, enough, enough. Um, <clears throat> although, of course, that will prolong the problems and that will prolong the issues underlying them. It won't actually get rid of them. Um, certainly, yeah, I, I was reasonably familiar with the philosophy of freedom. I had some of Steiner's books many years ago. I was in the process of collecting them. But as you know, uh, quick light fingers in some of my previous apartments, managed to help themselves. <clears throat> and it was only afterwards that I realized what had happened. So I've literally had uh, a few hundred books disappear that way over the years. Not good, but there we are. Um, and of course, I was a member of the Anthroposophical Society many years ago, and I've recently renewed my membership and, and intend to see how all this fits together at a much more elegant level. I mean, certainly I came across a an article a couple of years ago in the Catholic press, Roman Catholic press, and that's not to point the finger, uh, because a, I think any institution is guilty of picking off with a rifle, a metaphorical rifle, uh, people that don't appear to fit in. And it's just a shame that their rifle is so often a blunderbuss, um, as opposed to 
anything accurate. What was it in a column called Heretic of the Week? Uh, Rudolf Steiner was mentioned. As far I have to look that up so we can talk about it. Um, as far as I know, they didn't realize that Steiner had been raised Catholic. So, you know, there's that out the window. But what have facts got to do with it? Yeah. Um, and, you know, they certainly, as I have said on this show before, I think, you know, one of the most intelligent things I've ever heard was where someone I knew um, was offering, knew about, knew, knew, knew of, knew of, uh, was talking about Steiner and those books to a, a Roman priest. Um, and the guy said, yes, that's Catholicism at a higher level, which I thought was a, an incredibly intelligent thing to say, actually. Um, and that makes more organic sense than the heretic of the week, which makes no sense. Um, we've got to start looking for, you know, for ways to bond together and not really have these knee jerk reactions for anyone towards anyone of obvious genius and anyone that's really pioneering so many things. I mean, as I said again on the show, it just astonishes me that the academic community didn't. I mean, they wouldn't at the moment, but for, for the reasons we out, outlaid a minute ago, we explained a minute ago, you know, um, or at least largely wouldn't. It depends what part of the world, yada, yada, yada. You know, he's one of their own, and that should have been embraced in his lifetime. And it what yes, it was to a certain extent, but not the extent it should have been. Um, and, you know, focusing on other attributes of his career and his personality, um, I'm not trying to be, uh, avoid psychic, occult and esoteric, because people need to justify to me why those are off limits in the first place. And I've never really heard a convincing description. Uh, even Malachi Martin, uh, as someone I actually admire, despite all of the personal issues, um, and Leo, our mutual friend, uh, likes. But, you know, they, they, forgive me, Malachi, there's slightly more to it all than rushing into a room, waving a crucifix around and finding everybody else in the wrong. You know, there's, there's a bit more to life and spirituality and, and the occult. There's a bit more to it than that. That's not to detract from him. I think he's incredibly gifted and an incredibly astute man in particular fields was forgive me um but, you know we, we, martin israel i think was the anglican equivalent in this country i mean he wrote loads of books on the supernatural he was terribly terribly and awfully awfully which of course in the in the age of the common man doesn't go down too well i remember seeing him once on a british chat a chat show uh, remember until recently we haven't been overwhelmed like you Yankee boys with all these channels in my lifetime there were only three and when it when it got to channel four we were nearly nearly floating on the ceiling with joy I mean now there are loads now but they weren't back then and when channel four was starting out and it was doing all this experimental stuff and the BBC hated them because they hadn't thought of doing it um there was uh Martin Israel on one of these late night chat shows talking talking about not having reached a high spiritual level with the people he was with. And you think, you know, what, what are you talking about, man? Um, most of his stuff, as I say, was on the supernatural. Someone I know at the Church Times described him once as spooky. You know, isn't there more to, you know, this is an intelligent person with a very good education. But what's Martin Israel? Spooky. You know, we've got to, we've got to grow up and integrate i mean you know apart from the fact i think steiner's contribution to the arts is absolutely phenomenal um and that's really the area i'd like to focus on a lot more in, over the next couple of years i mean you're not looking at a small contribution you're looking at a gigantic contribution which is almost in britain underwhelming you know oh well, let's not talk about that let's talk about something else that's old stuff no why 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 um, all of that needs justification if it's not just the caprice of the moment. And let's face it, nine times out of ten, uh, nine times out of ten, it is the caprice of the moment. Um, so the supernatural needs to be incorporated. <coughs> excuse me, to my mind, not the paranormal. I'm, I'm so punch drunk with shows at the minute. I can't remember which one I've said anything on. Uh, the paranormal, of course, is a sort of supernature you know, Lyle Watson sort of concept, which is fine and great because all he's really saying 
is that there's more to materiality than all of us realize. Gosh, why is that so impactful? Why is that so why is that so astonishing? So, you know, there is a paranormality to what we know already. There are other dimensions, there are other attributes. Yeah, fine. Uh, I think the supernatural is an entirely different concept. Um, there is a, another order, at least one other order of being, which we interact with. That's mind-blowing and scary and wonderful and miraculous <clears throat> and may help to explain, excuse me again, angels in the Bible, which, of course, are not these rather beefy lads with, with magnificent wings. I mean... <laughs> They seem to be all eyes and all feathers. And, you know, one, one was described as having a face like thunder, thunder and lightning. I, I personally find that disturbing. If you think about what that means, that is actually quite disturbing. Um, you know, but that can't be, these things can't be ruled out and they can't tip the balance over the main view of somebody's career. Why shouldn't somebody talk about these things without becoming spooky? which is a child's reaction. Uh, so when I'm saying, you know, Steiner needs reassessing, which he clearly does, there needs to be a new Steinerian movement. Um, my, as, my, my own interest, as usual, you know, true to course, would be the arts. And I just wish people would stop stumbling over their own, over their own feet because he had a great deal to say on the esoteric. Um, you know, someone of that stature, someone of that, level of attainment i'm sure has something to say on next to everything and good on him handing it back to you john well yeah i mean uh my good friend brian david lynch he uh brilliant soul part of our monastic club back in the day and he used to run the serious bookshop in uh, Massachusetts. But he used to tell a story, a, a run in he had with, uh, it was a leading atheist. I, for, I forget whose name. I had to get a hold of Brian and find out because I'd forgotten. But it's a name that most people that concern themselves with those types of subjects do know. And he had said, because uh, he was asked about Rudolf Steiner, he said, and he said, uh, the philosophy of freedom is one of the greatest books of the 20th century, but what is all that other stuff? <laughs> and so there you have it. It's, it's like uh, people have uh, an acceptable context at which they're willing to approach reality. And if you step outside of that, then it's either scary or it's uh, foolishness and, and what have you. But those tend to be individuals that haven't had a super sensible experience themselves. They haven't, uh, they haven't seen little, little uh, elves. They haven't seen an angel. They haven't uh, heard uh, a super sensible a voice, uh, they haven't exited their body, you know? I mean, that happened to me when I was like, what, 19 years old, something like that. And uh, I, I tell the story before, but I'll tell it again because it's to the point here is that I was living in my band house at the time and uh, I was looking for a pencil and we weren't particularly studious, we were playing rock and roll. So we didn't have a whole lot of writing implements around the house, and I was looking for a pencil. And I knew I had one, and, and I'm looking all over, and I couldn't find it. There it is. <laughs> and I sat down in a chair in the corner, and I popped out of my body, and I was up on the ceiling for a minute or two, looking down at the top of my head. And I could see behind the chair, and there was all the dust bunnies and whatnot, that you'd expect in a band house. But uh, down there was that pencil. And when I popped in my body, I looked over the back of my chair and everything was exactly as I saw it from up in the ceiling. And so I actually know what the top of my head looks like. I mean, that's kind of unique because you can't really quite do it 
the same way with a mirror. <laughs> and so I, I told that story to the famous Dr. Timothy Leary. And I said, so tell me, uh, how does that play into your understanding? Can you explain it uh, neurologically? Because, I mean, I was outside of my brain, right? So can you explain that? And he, and he was a tremendously honest individual. And uh, he just said, no. I said, have you ever had an experience like that? He said, no. <laughs> I mean, he was really, his mind was kind of blown, you know. He was at the Mayflower visiting us and checking out books. And I was trying to get him interested in spirulina algae. Uh, I was part of the very small group of people uh, involved with Christopher Hills, Dr. Christopher Hills out of out of England, right? And but Christopher Hills got the he went into partnership with the Mexican government to take Lake Texacoco and turn it into a giant a freshwater spirulina pond and and have this rotating giant aerator. And it was creating this great, really lush green spirulina algae. But I had told them not to do it. I said, "This is going to end badly. Uh, <laughs> they're going to they're going to they're going to rip you off." He said, "No, you, we have to do this." And so, long story short, they nationalized the facility that he spent a million dollars of his own money. Uh, developing in partnership with them. So it was a $2 million ins installation. They spent a million, he spent a million, and then they just took it without getting his million dollars. So uh, that's the way of power, I guess. You know, uh, it's it's a challenge. But to digress, he, he's an interesting character because he kind of is borderland on, on what we're discussing here, because I see all, I was watching a, a interesting video the other day that was on the Dakini that came out just a few years ago. And it was an exploration into uh, Buddhism and the concept of the Dakini, which in, in Tantra you have Shiva and Shakti, so that the uh, Shiva is consciousness, and the Shakti represents energy. And so those two are, are conjoined, so to speak. But it's interesting because you see them uh, working into, into Buddhist scriptures and then trying to take it and, and fit it in with quantum mechanics, which is, to, in my mind, hilarious because uh, and I, I mean no disrespect for all you quantum mechanicists out there, but uh, I think that's going to go the way of most any things that come out of modern science is that, you know, like I, I've said time and time again, you know, they they finally figure it out, and then a year later they have to, update their books, but they don't update them usually. So you have to, if you go to school, you have to learn a bunch of stuff that they don't even believe anymore <laughs> until you graduate and then you go somewhere where you work and then they tell you what they're actually working on. You know? So it's, it's kind of funny, but uh, it goes back to that old story I told about my 20 year reunion when I ran into one of the brainiacs from school and I said, what have you been doing? He said, oh, I've been working on secret government projects. I said, oh, you're working on the holographic model of consciousness, eh? He goes, I can't talk to you. And he walked away. <laughs> so I guess, that, is that a, a cue that, that they are working on the holographic model of consciousness? And that being said, you know, when you get into that kind of thing and you get into the history of science, you'd be amazed how many scientific inventions came out of the world of dream. And the world of dream is the astral world. That's, that's the first level of, of clairvoyance in uh, the, the re realm of imagination. And so, like, for example, if we go to uh, uh, 
Dmitry Mendele Mendeleev. He was the uh, guy who formulated the, the periodic law, which is, it was like his visionary version that became the periodic table of elements. But the way it came to him, he said, and this is a quote, I saw in a dream a table where all elements fell into place as required. Awakening, I immediately wrote it down on a piece of paper. Only in one place did a correction later seem necessary. So there you have it. The, the history of science's relationship to the super sensible, because essentially that's what it is, even though people don't recognize that. But if I guess if people become too materialistic, they don't even dream anymore. So that's kind of sad. Uh, but uh, that being said, uh, so uh, these are these limits, these boundaries of consciousness. And, and if you're studying anthroposophy, you know that it's all about consciousness. And when he gets into explaining the Saturn, Sun, Moon, and then Earth evolution, the whole evol chain of evolution, it has to do with states of consciousness. So in the future, we'll have uh, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. And so this sevenfold chain of consciousness, this is what it's all about. And if you're into any subject like the, the, the concept of initiation or transcendental thinking and all of that, uh, in terms of that, enlightenment's entry level. Initiation goes beyond enlightenment. You know, that they, that's what a lot, a lot of people think. If I just go to enlightenment, I'll just stay there, you know, and I'll, I'll just like dissolve in the absolute. Well, were you to go into, into uh, Nirvikalpa Samadhi for an hour? Yeah, you'd die. That's true. <laughs> Your physical body would just drop away. But uh, it's interesting because in this Dakini movie, it, I have tremendous respect for Tibetan Buddhism, but there, it's pre-Christian uh, impulse, right? Because Buddha, 6th century BC, you know, so that he doesn't, uh, the scriptures they're working with are the input from the Buddha in a very early period. And so the later stages, because it's like what I told uh, Gaelic Rinpoche, the cousin of the Dalai Lama, and one of his teachers, I said, well, you know, Buddha's a Christian now. <laughs> you should have seen the wide-eyed look I got on that one. I'm not sure I'm pursuing that. <laughs> um, um, it's, uh, so you actually knew David Lynch. I'm, I'm totally jealous about that. Um, I, I still love the whole Twin Peaks thing, uh, Laura Palmer, Agent Cooper, I love all of it. Um, and I'm sorry, the one thing he, he really is bad at, so is the place with all the chairs separate from the Black Lodge or not? Because... No, that's that's Brian David Lynch. It's, it's, a, it's a friend of mine. But I had some interaction in, in around the circle of David Lynch because uh, a friend of mine was doing collectible cards for him, which is an interesting story, but go ahead. Well, no, I, I said that because I know you'd said to me before there was a connection. So I didn't, yeah. Um, oh, gosh, let me think. Where is all this? Yeah, I mean, I quite like the theosophical idea that the Buddha was the first putting it into very simple terms, the Buddha the, was the first human being to reach up to those lofty levels of consciousness, um, whereas the Christ energy was something reaching down. I mean, that's put in very simple terms, but I sort of like the simplicity and the profundity and the truth of that particular story. Um, I remember, I mean, I, I don't know how American ministers train. I mean, I... When I was at university, I actually majored in Hinduism and I minored in Buddhism. Uh, and it didn't get in the way of the Christianity, believe it or not. So, you know, I remember reading genuinely esoteric texts like the, the, the what was it, the Devi Mahatmya of the Markandeya Purana, where uh, all of the buffalo, what a bugger that buffalo is. 
is wandering around heaven and causing trouble and all the gods have to get together and generate their shaktis and the shakti becomes the one great goddess the devi uh, and the devi without her the buffalo would still be there she gives it a good hiding and the buffalo gets back to where it's meant to be and you end up thinking as a mere westerner are they aware of the implication of that story? I mean, you're talking about monotheism, point one. Point two, so it's a goddess that's the primary thing, not a god. Thirdly, so the origin of, of, of evil is actually a fundamental cosmic misunderstanding. Uh, the buffalo in itself isn't evil, but its actions give rise to that. And so, you know... <laughs> And you think, my God, and that's all in the concept, all in the all in, you know, a frame of concepts around a female absolute. I mean, that's I don't think there's anything comparable in the West. Um, so I, I've always rather liked Shakti talk, um, and of course, it's also something to do with with pop groups, I think, and uh, and other things. Um, in terms of uh, Wittgenstein, since we're talking about the highfalutin esoteric stuff at the minute. Um, yeah, I mean, he had a thing. <laughs> Is there anyone Wittgenstein didn't have a thing about? Um, you know, including Bertrand Russell, of course. Um, one of my favorite stories, and forgive me, everybody, if I've said it before. There was one afternoon when they were both together, I think, in Bertie's study, but Bert, you know, some common room or something, where Bertrand Russell was explaining that sort of half, you know, half humanist sort of very pleasant attitude to the world that bourgeois humanism tends to have, to which Wittgenstein said he'd rather be bayoneted to death than actually become one of its adherents, um, which I thought was, was a little strong, but point taken. Um, yeah, I personally, I was always, uh, uh, I always gravitated towards the latter Wittgenstein, not because I find the initial, the former Wittgenstein, any less than, um, I mean, the Tractatus, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, he felt, and so do many, did many, do many other people, that it was the last word you could actually have on any traditional understanding of language, that, that, that really there was nowhere else to go. I'm sort of tempted to think there was a point there. Um, but, you know, that... that <laughs> He got to a stage when he gave up philosophy for years, having thought he'd actually sold everything. Um, I noticed Bertie didn't say you hadn't, uh, or you know you haven't done that. But you know it was uh, it was all these mystical experiences he'd had as a younger man that eventually unsettled him into saying that you know that that wasn't that couldn't be the last comment. And so I've always veered towards the uh, philosophical investigations, <clears throat> not only because it's a revolution in terms of philosophy and what philosophy might actually be doing, <clears throat> excuse me, analytic philosophy in particular. I mean, I'm a, I tend to be a continental. In this part of the world, the academy is divided into the Continental Academy and the Anglo-American Academy. The Anglo-American Academy is analytic. I mean, that's the bottom line. Whereas it's arguable that the, uh, Euro the, the Europeans approach things much more from a sort of um, interconnective approach. I mean, there are other better ways of saying that. But you know, they, they, they approach things through ideas as opposed to analyses. Um, I have great difficulty working out why philosophical investigations is always held as one of the Meister Volks of Anglo-American analysis, because some of the areas it goes into clearly don't belong in that tradition. And you know, he's what he's doing. So he's closed something down with the logico, with the tractatus, but he's opened something up again with the philosophical investigations, saying, "Look, I mean, you know, we can't just pretend there aren't other types of human experience." I mean, what am I getting at here? Um, the latter, Wittgenstein. Um, would have said, right, there are language games, there are scientific language games, there are, say, religious, there are there are esoteric language games. His error, I mean, you know, games theory came a lot, a lot after him. 
but it really comes from the same stable of thinkers, I think. The same, you know, the same stable of analysts which are trying to get towards, you know, what is it that provokes people, that pushes people into thinking like this? In other words, into deep analyses, into making sudden connections when no connection had previously been given. And the idea was it was, uh, who do you look at for that? You look at children. They're, const they're the best learners. They're constantly not only learning through their mistakes. They're not sat grouchy worrying about their mistakes. They're, they're analyzing and they're getting on with it. They get up and they dance around again. And, you know, and they make connections which the formal academicians simply can't or won't or, or have difficulty with. Um, so, you know, what is a language game? What is that type of circle of discourse got to do with an esoteric language game? And the answer must be nothing. Uh, you're, you're entering two different spheres <clears throat> and you can talk about scientific materialism perfectly well in that sphere. But to start applying the rules and principles of that type of discourse say to meditation is simply inappropriate and will never work and you haven't really explained anything you haven't analyzed and you haven't explained anything and i <clears throat> excuse me what i see in that is a deep underlying mysticism um and certainly victor shine would not say that wasn't there and what he's trying to do is liberate it's a time bomb it's a time bomb that hasn't gone up yet what he's trying to do is liberate other types of discussion from the shackles that have been put on it by a, a different type of discourse. You know, what have the sciences really, really, really got to say about A, B, C, and D? And the answer is very little. Uh, the fact it's very little for Wittgenstein was a clue that they're doing different things. It's not that one shrivels under the, you know, fearsome focus of the other. He'd think that was naive. It's just that they're not... <laughs> There's no interconnection, and how could there be? Um, and anyway, I don't know what you think about all that, John. I'm probably getting too carried away. I'll just say one thing, actually, uh, which I think I have said on this show. Uh, a, a chum of mine years back was DZ Phillips. Um, you know, for a while in Wales, there was sort of the Wittgensteinian school. He didn't really catch on in England in the same way, and there's another, there's a whole raft of reasons behind that. Um, my God, he's a foreigner, isn't he? You know, there's that sort of prejudicial nonsense that always impairs every type of nobility in this country. Um, it didn't catch on the way it should have done. In Wales, it did. Um, and certainly DZ Phillips, Dewey, how about that for a good name, um, who was a Congregationalist minister, most people tend to forget that, was actually, I mean, his focus was actually on Wittgensteinian views of religion. I mean, he did look at the other stuff as well, but the main focus was on, you know, what are we doing there? If we're playing the language game of religion, what are we actually doing within that language game? Uh, and his work, I think, including a book like The Concept of Prayer, I don't know if you've ever looked at it. I mean, it's staggering. It's absolutely staggering. You know, how can you say to someone that's just lost a partner, someone that's just lost a child, how can you say don't pray? And if you say to them, don't pray, what do you mean? You know, it's, it, oh, there's no God there. Well, what does that mean? You know, if you're, you're a man tries, a man or woman tries to live their lives devoted to the Christ image, how can you say God is not, Christ is not in that life? That makes no sense. Um, you know, are you talking about the quantifiable or the qualitative? So back to the beginning of this discussion. For Wittgenstein, um, both of those arguments were in a particular language game, but obviously one had greater focus in the scientific uh, uh, language games than it would in the religious language games. Uh, don't know what you think of all that, John, but certainly you'd have enjoyed meeting DZ Phillips. This was the story. Uh, he gave a lecture for the University of London once. Uh, everybody, the great and the gay, so yes, it did include me, turned up to listen to his, his, his romantic Welsh drawl. And he delivered this masterful lecture for over an hour and a half. Um, and I think it was good. It might have been a bit longer if I'm thinking about it. And there's there's always one. There's some voice that, you know, some non-entity that said from the back, all oh, this only works if there's a God. To which he said, turned around and said, 
I've never said there wasn't a God. And you, you get this elegant, elegant Welsh slap. And some of us completely missed the argument for an hour and a half. Anyway, John, back to you. Sorry for getting highfalutin. Um, I think this show is on the verge of not only maybe a new type of anthroposophy, but certainly on the spirit. It's unleashing maybe in a new way what anthroposophy is, has always been trying to do. You know, that thoughts on my mind at the moment. I'm shutting up for handing over. Well, or perhaps that's new for you. The It's interesting because if you get into like somebody like Wittgenstein, who many people feel is the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, uh, I think that he's up there. Uh, it's interesting. My basic take on Wittgenstein is it's simple. He's not a philosopher, he's an artist. Right? What does the artist have to say about philosophy? And uh, again, if and he's also a Christian, by the way. And that was the focus of the later period in his life was this relationship to, to Christ. So, and again, if you go back to those three individuals that we used to refer to frequently in the some of our earlier What is Truth series, that the they did that study at the uh, university and they were coming up with uh, an analysis using that the newly created uh, schemata of the IQ. And so they started investigating historical figures and the three highest IQs they came up were Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and Emanuel Swedenborg and uh, what's his name? Um, I, I know his name. <laughs> well, it's obviously not me, uh, John Stuart Mill. And, uh, but all three of them are Christian and uh, two of them are occultists, Christian occultists. So that's kind of disturbing to a lot of your churchlings, you know, cause they think that that's, there's something evil when Jesus Christ was the greatest occult teacher. Occult means hidden. He revealed that which is hidden. Nothing is hidden that shall not be revealed. And so we have to look really closely at this. And, and Rudolf Steiner referred to uh, the writers of the Gospels as occultists. And if anybody's occultists, it's, it's the writers of the Gospels. I'm sorry, but that's the reason why the smartest people in history concern themselves with its content, because it's like an onion. You can just, no matter how deep you go, it's still there uh, challenging you to dig deeper. And so I guess that's what we're looking at. It's because in, in my take on all of this, it's, it's ultimately, it's about your personal relationship to Christ. And that's, again, if you get to Goethe and his great uh, travels of, of Wilhelm Meister and, and the apprenticeship of Wilhelm Meister. It's a, it's a, a novel that he wrote that's it's about initiation. And Wilhelm Meister is kind of a, he's a, you'd think of him almost like a hippie because he's not one of those hardworking, uh, put your nose to the grindstone kind of characters. You know, he, he struts off on his own. He's going to let serendipity provide him with his destiny. And he ends up meeting a, a uh, brotherhood, an, an occult brotherhood uh, of a Rosicrucian type. And he's led into this chamber and they have these pictures and they're scenes from the Old Testament. And he thought it was remarkable and, you know, that they had these scenes of allegorical uh, potency, so to speak. And he said, but you know, where's Jesus Christ? And they said, 
oh, well, come with me. And then he took them in, in another room. And there you had these pictures relating to the life of Jesus Christ. And they said that, well, this is different because the, uh, when it comes to Jesus Christ, it has to do with you as an individual and your relationship to him. And so that's where Goethe was coming from and relating to his Christianity, is that nobody has the right to come between you and your relationship to Jesus Christ. And that's the mystery of the Kyrios, right? Which the Kyrios is translated as Lord. But Rudolf Steiner makes the point that Kyrios is very profound because what is what is that relating to? And, it, and you go back to uh, the story of the burning bush and, and the Ia Asher Ia, I am the I am. Well, what is that? Well, that's, that's the Christ uh, speaking to Moses. But at the time, it was from outside because the Christ hadn't really taken its abode in uh, human nature. There was, there was a seed planted back early, early in Earth evolution in the Lemurian period for that. That, that is gradually developing, but it didn't come to fruition until the mystery of Golgotha. And so that whole idea that your individual ego is that Christ in you that St. John the Divine talks about. And, and it's up to you to develop that relationship. It's not up to somebody else. It's not up to belonging to some club or some denomination. It's, it's greater than that. And so Rudolf Steiner also says, once mankind begins to develop this faculty that arises as a result of this new development uh, that was brought about by the Archangel Gabriel in the roughly 350, 400-year period of the Archangel period of Gabriel that ended in 1879, that gave us an actual physical uh, touchstone, so to speak, for our future development of consciousness. Once mankind begins to unfold the consciousness soul as a spiritual soul by by uh, involving it in spiritual content, then there won't be a need for uh, denominations because people will have that strong connection to Jesus Christ himself. And it's, it's all about that. I mean, I remember the story about uh, Leo Zagami when he had Alex Jones come with him to the Vatican and he gave him a tour of the all the different things in the Vatican and he takes him to the Jesuit headquarters and they go in there and, and this guard comes up <laughs> and starts harassing them about going around the Jesuit headquarters and, he, and Leo starts talking about Jesus Christ and the guy's Oh, we don't care about that here. Go on, get out of here. They he kicked them out, right? So it's like, yeah, they really don't, do they? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but uh, Jesuits are not Catholic. They're Jesuits. And so now they have a Jesuit pope. So, you know, it becomes really challenging. But uh, my friend, uh, Joe Visconti, who ran for a governor in uh, Connecticut. He got into Rudolf Steiner from his mother because uh, his parents had both gotten into it because his mother went to uh, a Catholic seminary in the library there and she found a bunch of Rudolf Steiner books. <laughs> and he uh, ended up asking uh, uh, this one uh, priest about that he said well the the adult catholics read steiner <laughs> and i know that john paul pope john paul ii he he studied rudolf steiner a friend of mine was his altar boy in the vatican and uh he was in shock that i knew that and in shock and i, I have pictures of uh Pope John Paul with copies of Valentin Tomberg's Meditations on the Tarot sitting on his desk, the German edition. 
So yeah, there there is that. And uh, one of my mentors, uh, Werner Glass, who was his mentor, was Walter Janus Stein, the altar of the ninth century world history in the light of the Holy Grail when he was in, in Assisi and he was looking at uh, a painting there and a, a Franciscan monk walked up to him and asked him if he was an anthroposophist. He said, yes, why? He says, I could tell by the way you were looking at that painting. <laughs> and he took him into the library at Assisi and they had the complete uh, Rudolf Steiner's collected edition there, the Gesamtesgabe. And then, so they asked him a lot of questions and all of that. So it, there's this thing, but it's, you know, it's not something that you, you proselytize about. It's something that requires deep commitment to be able to enter into the work of Rudolf Steiner. And so that's, that's a challenge in and of itself. But that being said, so we're rolling along here, and I don't want to forget to remind you that our friend here, Archbishop David William Perry, is an author, and his first book was The Grammar of Witchcraft, and it's a Shakespearean study, and uh, it's not a grimoire. It's a very contemplative work on Shakespeare. His second volume is Caliban's Redemption, Caliban is a magical character in Shakespeare, and it's his, his esoteric poetical musings. And his main work, almost a decade in the making, uh, it's uh, Meditations and Experiences of uh, Reverend David, which interweaves Mount Athos, the arts, religion, philosophy, theater, literature, and poetry. And it's a wonderful book, Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg and the Arts, which was edited by the very talented Daniela Irinduist. And these are all available on Amazon. And uh, so pick up a copy and you can keep up with us. As for myself, I only have two books. Uh, my first book is The Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, with text and diagrams, and that's 640 pages. It's a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order. And it has a foreword by my best buddy, uh, Douglas Gabriel and extensive diagrams and bibliography and the complete series of diagrams that are based on the diagrams of Aaron for Pfeiffer, the student of Rudolf Steiner that crossed my desk many, many years ago. But uh, they're the Grail diagrams, of course, I added a great many more and added to them from the work of Rudolf Steiner. And so uh, the more complete series of diagrams is in my second book, The Arcana of Light on the Path. And it's more of a meditative tool with a forward by the noted astrosopher, uh, William Bento, the late William Bento, wonderful soul. And those are available on eBay. Of course, if you're outside the continental US, you can contact me directly and I can work out an arrangement through PayPal for you to get the books overseas. And um, that's well and good. And like I said, uh, they're available on eBay here in the States. And uh, you can look for them elsewhere, but they tend to get a little pricey. I, I've seen them $1,000, $1,200, you know, out of print, rare. And well, I have a few copies. So, um, but not very many. So if you're thinking of it, I wouldn't wait too long. And if you're interested in buying us cups of coffee uh, for Reverend David, it's paypal.me forward slash D-P-A-R-R-Y 777. And for myself, it's paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. Well, I got all that in. 
it's a lot to remember, you know. Uh, but then beyond that, I also have to uh, add to to this is that this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla, Vadim, Vivian, and Neil, and Christian, and Mark, and Maud, and Druvman, and Laura, and Paula, and Rick, and Michael, and so many others over the years. So I thank you all for supporting our humble efforts. And it really is humble, <laughs> because I'm, I'm always humbled before, especially like the work of Russ Steiner, not to mention humbled before the Bible. I mean, it's just, there's no end to it. And uh, I think that's the beauty. And that's why uh, it really should be considered a book for the future, because people at this time, they don't have the concepts to, to grasp uh, many of the deeper things. And, and that's why uh, Rudolf Steiner's work is basically a study of the I am, and it, it takes 36 and a half feet of shelf space just to, to give you cliff notes. <laughs> so there is no end to this journey. That's the beauty of it, is that the, the further you go, the, the, the more you have to continue. And so that's, that's the thing. That's why What is Truth podcast, it's a question. Because questions, it's an open set. As soon as you, you feel that you have closure, like you're all done, well, that's, that's when you enter into entropy. And, and you don't want to collapse into a black hole like they, they think. And, and, but that's what the type of thinking they use is capable of, is, is coming to that kind of a conclusion because the super sensible is excluded from the equation. It reminded me of a couple of things there. I mean, you were the one that said a couple of shows back <clears throat> the original phrase that it was uh, anthroposophy was for mature Roman Catholics, and you got me digging. And therefore, I came across a half-remembered story from years back. I think that's more of a common perception than I thought. When you said that, I thought that's spot on a couple of shows ago. And I still think it's spot on. But I think, you know, you've now talked about a Franciscan almost sensing in a super sensible way, you know, an attitude, a, a, a mindset, a body posture. I think that's much more common than people have any suspicions about because it is it takes catholicism to the highest to a much higher level well let me just add a little bit to what this this franciscan was was sensing because when you get into what rudolf steiner says about art he says when you look at a painting like uh, uh raphael or one of the great truly great painters and and this can go for the music, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and all of that. Is that we don't don't just look at the painting. Try to connect to that which inspired him to create the work of art, because artists don't realize the divine spiritual beings that are are behind their creativity. So that's the point, really. Um, and also, I loved what you said about Wittgenstein, the artist, <clears throat> at the risk of dragging my own career slightly into it. Um, the Mount Athos book was written as a poet. Um, I was deliberately trying to write it as a poet, would write about those things. I hope that came across at least a little. The idea was never a series of analyses, because <clears throat> um, that can be easily done, and I think that's already been done. And unless you've got the sort of Wittgensteinian turn of mind, um, you probably won't get there, uh, or unless you've got this obsessive need to speak in lyricism and prose poetry. <clears throat> but as I say, it was an attempt to do that. I hope it's relatively successful. <clears throat> in terms of... Um, oh, good, you've just said so much. <clears throat> Sorry, John. <clears throat> I'm now choking for no reason whatsoever. I'm noticing how speckly I am when I get close to... 
close to the camera. I mean, I'm looking basically like a thousand year old white dude at the minute that's gone all speckly. I, that happened to me overnight. I don't know what's gone on overnight. Obviously, I was abducted by aliens who've been probing me in various ways because when I went to bed last night, that wasn't there. Right, these bits are where I have shaved quickly for this show because I want to try and look half presentable. Uh, so I've yet, apart from the fact I've half cut my throat, uh, yes, I've now got speckles out of nowhere. I hope I, they're gone by next week. And if the aliens are going to do it again, can you please do it on a different evening when I've not got a show with John Barnwell the next day? Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Victor Stein. Um, oh, I don't know. I, I'd love a show on him at some point, actually. Um, there's an anthroposophy there. I mean, you're perfectly right. I, mean, I, let, I laid anthroposophy down for a number of years because I felt back then I wasn't getting on top of it. I mean, do you ever get on top of it? But I felt back then, you know, OK, not that I was going in circles. I mean, there was so much dense material. You know, I, I, I remember feeling, oh, gosh, you know, this is frustrating. Do you have to d devote your life to it? If you devote your life to it, what does it mean? If you're going to be a clergyman, you know, yada, 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 yada. yada. So I confess, yeah, I mean, this is a not only a rediscovery for me of the anthroposophical spirit, but a, a, li literally a new lease of anthroposophical life uh, where I'm beginning to see connections everywhere. I mean, the man's attainments, the man's achievements, Steiner's achievements, and I don't think anthroposophy is purely synonymous with Steiner, but that's, a, that's something else. Um, yeah, uh, they're nearly off the scale. I mean, if ever anyone wanted the concept of an adept, look at the life of Rudolf Steiner. You know, are they all evil and self-seeking? Look at the life of Rudolf Steiner. And in, in seconds, you'll realise they're not. And the, the one quote that I found recently, which is wheedling, wheedling its way into one of the new texts I'm working with, that he was asked about his politics as a youth now i'm saying as a youth i don't know what they were later on in life but i love what he said as a youth he said he was basically an individualist anarchist which if you go to the austria of that time tends to mean this group of golden individuals that are sort of reframing the academy around them you know they're they're, they're questioning everything that's been inherited to them but in such a positive and creative way that they haven't fallen into the modern trap of simply deconstructing for the sake of deconstruction. Uh, something, of course, that even Derrida doesn't actually do. Has anybody read his books? Everybody loves talking about deconstruction. And um, I, I was always in two minds. I heard about him years and years back. Bit of an old lefty. I mean, nothing unusual in France. I mean, a bit of an old lefty whinging. I mean, that's typical, isn't it? Um, and it was only when I saw a documentary that was made about him years later where you see you see him from behind with this shock of white hair like a lion walking down the Champs-Élysées, clearly trying to pick up young people. And you think, my God, right, there's a live wire. Let, let's see what he's about. Um, and I, I don't know, at first I was quite resistant to what he was trying to say, you know, what are you aiming at nihilism or not? And that's the question anyone reading Derrida really has to face for themselves. Is this some, some sort of simple-minded exercise in nihilism or not? The answer from my perspective is clearly not. Um, what he's trying to do is explore an archaeology of language and the development of conceptual structures layer by layer by layer. And he's asking something quite radical and necessary. What is underneath? And really, it's not until the end of his career where he starts writing about the indestructible. Right, so that's God then. Where, where his thoughts are about what cannot be deconstructed, that the whole of it suddenly makes sense. You're looking at this rapacious, aggressive intellect as a young man that's got something, you know, like, like a stone in his shoe or something. It's a, an irritation, like a grain of sand in an oyster. It just won't go away and it won't stop. And the oyster's struggling and struggling and all these beautiful things are happening. Um, and all of a sudden, mid-career, he seems to go into this sort of 
slough of despond. You know, where is all this leading? He, even he was thinking it. Until you get to the latter Derrida, where all of a sudden these vistas of thought are opening. But of course, by that time, sadly, he's already been framed by the academy as sort of a, a as I said a minute ago, a lefty whinger, as opposed to somebody who's actually looking for something divine and, and claiming he's found it, which is the bit they don't want to hear at the moment, that he's not only on the edge of discovering something truly transpersonal and wonderful, the absence of the absence which leads to yeah, yeah, all of a sudden looking at this, this pregnant form of theology that won't use metaphysics as far as that's possible. That is a revolution and that's very exciting. And it, it saddens me so greatly that the modern academy simply doesn't want to look at where this the mammoth struggle with himself, with language, eventually led to. I'll hand, you, hand it back to you, John. Yeah, well, he he's a, he is a good example, and uh, and you're sharing something that, that I did. I wasn't aware of that about Derrida because I'm I'm one of the people that's that's very much critical of uh, that postmodernist deconstruction thing. Uh, it and getting into that whole left leaning thing because basically what what the end game is of all that okay fine you've thought all this through and so what you, you think what we need is some kind of totalitarian superstructure is what is is what the 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 school of thought that that tends to identify with that particular school of deconstruction that's their end game which is this nonsense we're going through right now so, uh, and and here you have, on the other hand, you have Rudolf Steiner saying that, that referring to anarchy, you know, what's, what, what's his point about this whole anarchy? That, that, that there's a divine principle of freedom. And so a lot of the strivings of the left, while well-intentioned, though they may claim, that they they want to cure the ills it's because they live in the realm of abstract thought that they don't have the the secure the 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 comfort of the super sensible uh that is provided through religion and whatnot so they want to try and fill that hole with some kind of earthly structure and it never works it never has worked there is no example of a any kind of super state that that fixed anything and so well, here we are you know this is again that that you can't find all your answers in this world and and you know when they ask jesus they they you know if he was the the king of the Jews, and he and he said, "My kingdom is not of this world." And, and furthermore, when he said, "I am the door," he didn't say, "I'm one of the doors." He said, "I am the door." He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so, you have something like you you were saying before that the Buddha is that great striving from below upwards. Out of out of our humanity, to be able to encompass the absolute, the difference is that the the Christ is that which came from above and entered into human evolution, to bring it into a transformation, and so the the whole idea of the resurrection is is as a fact of Christianity, which is so difficult for people like Derrida to wrap their head around. But yet Wittgenstein went to his grave contemplating that as a reality. Likewise, Goethe, likewise, uh, so many of the uh, profound thinkers, you know, uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, you just go down the list of profound thinkers and you look at uh, Spinoza, 
a very interesting character, really struggling with that, gets accused of being an atheist because of the way he was so bluntly honest with his strugglings with the works of Immanuel Kant. But then Rudolf Steiner says, but yet soon after reincarnates as, as Fichte. And there you see in Fichte the actual underpinnings, the philosophical underpinnings that give you the tools to be able to approach it. The only way you can approach the divine, according to esoteric Christianity, is through threefold thinking. And so that's why you have the divine trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, 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 that triune nature, that's built into the system in which we live. And so that the, the mystery of number, we'll, we'll explore that further. But we're right out of time here, I see. We're having so much fun. But if you could, David, uh, share with us one of your wonderful prayers to con confirm and consecrate our efforts. This will be your first prayer here as an Archbishop of Antioch. Um, firstly, I think we need to show on Derrida. I mean, obviously, he's not on the same level for me as a, a Wittgenstein, but uh, uh, maybe the latter part of his career needs to be known a bit better because nobody's speaking about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm of that sort of quasi-Celtic background, so the shamrock, oh, I'm so sick of prayer to St. Patrick, you know, the shamrock as a teaching mechanism, the divine trinity has always been very important to me. Um, yeah, Celtic Catholicism is important as well, that needs a show. John, I don't think this show is running away anytime soon because there's so much more we've got to talk about. Um, but let me finish with a prayer. My dear friends, bow your hearts for just one moment as we think of the week ahead. And indeed, we think of all the turbulence around us at the moment. We think of the troubles in our personal lives, in our family lives, in our community lives, in our national lives, our international lives, because we have a life in all of those spheres. But let's remember that which keeps us human. Let's remember the light that keeps the road ahead illumined. And let's hope that Christ would bless each one of us and enlarge our territories, that his hand will be laid upon us and keep us from harm, and that he will allow us to be free of pain on every level, and that the great glory that lies ahead of each one of us is never lost again, no matter how difficult or sad or dark the day might be, the night might be that we find ahead of us. God bless each and every one of you until we meet again. Amen. Well, thank you, your grace, and we'll see you next week. And thank everybody for showing up. And for those that couldn't show up, you'll catch us in the future. Hello to you, too. <laughs>